Good evening. If I could um, have your attention, we'll get started. My name is Chase Robinson. I'm the president of the Graduate Center. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this featured program of Richard Schechner Day, in which we're honoring the renowned theater artist and pioneer of performance studies. Tonight, after a conversation with Frank Henschker of our own Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, Richard will give a rare presentation reading selections from five decades of his notebooks, his fiction, and his poetry. Now, for those of you who don't know much about where you are sitting, one or two sentences, the Graduate School is, uh, the Graduate Center is the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, but it is much more than that. It's also a center for applied and theoretical research, a platform for performance and conversation and public debate. As a community of faculty and students committed to the perhaps unfashionable idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs that feature eminent thinkers, writers, artists, and cultural leaders. Tonight, we welcome a major figure in the world of theater who is all of the above. Known internationally as a director, as a teacher, a theorist, a writer, editor, and founder of the performance group and East Coast Artists, Richard Schechner is currently university professor at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts and editor of TDR, the Journal of Performance Studies. His many influential books include Environmental Theater, between theater and anthropology, performance theory, and performed imaginaries released just this year. Now, enough of me. I'm pleased to introduce Frank Henschker, who's the executive director and director of programs at the Martin E. Siegel Center, an important part of the New York theater landscape. The Siegel Center bridges a gap between academic and professional performing arts communities with a wide range of programs, notably its Prelude Festival. Please join me in welcoming him and our honored guest, Richard Schechner. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chase, for your kind and most uh, generous uh, words. My name is Frank Henschke, and I'm the executive director and director of programs at the Siegel Center. And we do bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And uh, uh, this day, the Richard Schechner Day, is truly a significant one uh, for us. It's the first time we have done uh, such a format where we have all day long sessions, in-depth discussions. So really far the furthest removed from the sound bites of four or five minutes, something was a truly remarkable event with truly national leaders of the field who was here with us um, all day. And it was a great, great honor to have uh, Richard uh, with us. Uh, Richard uh, is something like a Stephen Hawkins in physics or an Andy Warhol who was a director, a filmmaker, a publisher. He made records. He also uh, did his famous uh, 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 prints and, uh, and was a nexus. They, com they combined people, brought people together. And think Richard in all his life, in his over 80 years on this uh, planet Earth, really has done something remarkable. And uh, it's really uh, something we look up to and in the heaven uh, of theater and performance studies in a good sense it is a star where we all guide our little wooden ships and look what would Richard say and what would he do. Um, the bio is in the program um, so um, I will not read it all it's truly worth reading it's an exceptional work uh, it's an exceptional body of work and this is of course also um, the hallmark of a really great artist a body of work um, that has been created and he is still uh, strongly uh, going on and this is by no way a uh, culmination is just a milestone and uh, we are truly uh, uh, honored that we are the ones in New York City and in the Americas for hosting you here. I know it was in Paris in London so uh, thank you Richard for trusting us. The uh, format of the evening as Chase said there will be a, a short uh, introduction by me. B Richard will read from his uh, new book uh, Performed Imaginary some some pages as a start off for a shorter conversation and then something truly rare and remarkable will happen. Richard will read from his notebooks, from poetry, short stories, things he has not done in public, and most 
might not do it again, or we hope he will, but uh, it is a truly a, a remarkable a moment we can all share here together uh, in this room and uh, with Richard. So um, thank you so much for coming, Richard. We would like to invite you to read the beginning of your newest publication, Performed Imaginaries. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chase and CUNY and everybody who worked with me during the day. It was an extraordinary day because the interrogators or the people I was talking to, I'm looking at two of them, Joseph Roach and uh, Marvin Carlson, and there were uh, others, Paula Murray Cole, there were many. Uh, know me from a variety of ways and kind of, although uh, I'm, I, I hope I don't uh, look like it, I'm the elephant who you, somebody says has a trunk, somebody says has a tusk and so on, but none of these people really know all of me. Uh, I don't even know all of me. And this was a rare opportunity to have a kind of scan of my work from the Ramlila in India, through my directing, through my teaching, my scholarship, my editing, and these collaborators, uh, Mary Ellen Sanford over there, Rishika Marishi, who's somewhere, I don't see her in the room right now, uh, uh, all participated in this, and I really am very, very, very thankful. And what we did during the day, I was confident about, I know that stuff. What I'm doing tonight is truly, from my perspective, scary. I began uh, out in the lobby. There are my notebooks. There's one, a blue one, says number one, 1952 or 53, something like that. They go continuously to the present. There are only a few of them distributed out there. And what's in those notebooks is a uh, repository of things I don't really think hard about. Some I do and some I don't. It's just whatever is going on, I put there. In recent years, since the uh, advent of the computer as an efficient machine, I've done notebooking by uh, typing, and I have a, a lot of files on my notebooks. I'll be reading some of them. I didn't bring the physical notebooks on stage here to read from because they're written in shorthand, a lot of them. And I would have to, s I mean, I know what they mean, but the handwriting is not that good. They're not meant for publication. Sometime after my present form has been absorbed into whatever future form is going to absorb it, uh, and after some uh, people who I want not to read the notebooks. After all of that, the notebooks will be open to public view at the Richard Schechner Papers at the Princeton Library. I doubt whether anybody will ever read all 80,000 pages, but they will find certain interesting things in them, and I will read a little bit from a few of them. I'm going to uh, begin, but not by that, but by this performed imaginaries. The very idea of performed imaginaries is very important to me as a concept. I think I talked about that this afternoon, that if indeed I am to some degree, given my age, pessimistic about the future of the species, about the human project, at another level as an individual and as a social being, I am optimistic or viscerally committed to the happy continuation of life and the improvement of life. So Performed Imaginaries, uh, the book itself, deals with that in many ways. But I'm going to read just two brief sections from the opening uh, chapter, which is called, Can We Be the New Third World? I sit here this morning, does it really matter which morning, trying to be optimistic. 
I want to write how performance studies and the performing arts can save the world, or at least help save the world. I am typing while rockets and bombs are exploding in Gaza and Israel. Egypt is in turmoil. Syria in the throes of civil war. M23 rebels are closing on Goma in the Congo, putting a million people under threat. Suicide bombings and assassinations continue in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Somali civil war is ongoing. Sunnis and Shias have warred against each other since the martyrdom of Hussein in 680 CE. In India, Hindus murder Muslims and vice versa. Anti-Semitism is rife in many places. And not long ago, Catholics and Protestants were murdering each other in Northern Ireland, a few centuries after religious wars decimated Europe. The Shoah is not ancient history. I am more than halfway through my 79th year when I wrote this. For 71 of those years, the USA has been at war. Big wars, small wars, long wars, short wars, good wars, bad wars, just wars, greedy wars, invasions, incursions, missions, actions in Europe, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, Africa. From World War II and the Korean War to Grenada, Operation Urgent Fury, and Lebanon, twice, 1958 and 1982-1984, from Vietnam to Iraq and Afghanistan, from Serbia to Libya, and Panama, Cambodia, El Salvador, Colombia, Liberia, Egypt, Zaire, Kosovo, Bosnia, East Timor, Yemen, the Philippines, Congo, Ivory Coast, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Honduras, dot, dot, dot. And where America has not sent troops, it has sent arms, trained soldiers, created alliances, and supported proxy armies, sometimes with grotesque paradoxes, such as helping Saddam Hussein invade Iran, precipitating a bloody stalemate from 1980 to 1988, a half million dead, and then barely three years later, turning against Saddam with Operation Desert Storm, and after that, in 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom, where the USA led the a coalition of the willing. Who's kidding who? Plus untold covert actions and wars waged by surrogates with American advisors, the dirty wars in Latin America fought in the name of anti-communism, the Cold War with its nuclear buildup still not substantially dismantled. What about the close calls from the Cuban Missile Crisis to the US 7th Fleet patrolling the strait between mainland China and Taiwan, the continued showdown against North Korea and Iran over their nuclear arms program, the U.S. Congressional Research Service in its, quote, instances of use of United States armed forces abroad, unquote, reports that from 1950 to 2006, there were 153 occasions when American forces went on missions outside the borders of the USA. No year was without its particular military excursion. Many years had several. Yes, some were for just causes or humanitarian reasons, but most were applications by force of U.S. policy. In addition to active armed intervention is the U.S. presence, troops stationed in bases around the world, and multiple covert operations. Covert means classified, secret, kept from public view and accountability even in self-professed and a self-professed open society with its free press. Who knows, who knows how many secret actions there have been and how many continue today. These operations, surgery, involve intelligence, what a weird name for spying and dirty tricks, terror and torture in camps such as Guantanamo and secret black sites around the world. Even the seven years of peace, my infancy and early childhood from 1934 to 1941, were gloomed by the 1937 Japanese invasion of China, the Nazi and Soviet invasions of Poland in 1939, and the preparations for the USA's entry into World War II. 
And what about the wars within American borders, war being used only partly metaphorically? The House Un-American Activities Committee, 1938-1975. The anti-communist witch hunt led by Senator Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s. The violent response to the African-American civil rights movement and gay liberation. The Patriot Act, the war on drugs, dot, dot, dot. The list goes on and on. I'll stop there for that part of this essay. Uh, I want you to ruminate on what I've presented. I'll jump ahead to the New Third World and read the dark, bright side of what I've just read, the dark side of it. Today, artists, activists, and scholars are a New Third World. I had talked in the essay about Nehru's proposition that's opposed to the bipolar world of the Soviet Union and the United States. He proposed a new, a third world um, in 1955. Today, artists, activists, and scholars are a new third world. Nehru's third world had a specific geographical location. Today's new third world is a proportion of people present everywhere with a majority nowhere. What unites the new third world is a community of purpose a mode of inquiry, the experimental, if you will, and a sense of being other, of not being hangers-on. The new third world is incipient, seeds not yet fully aware. The new third world needs to organize itself as, quote, non-aligned, quote, neither capitalist, whether of the USA or the Chinese brand, nor knee-jerk communist socialist, nor fundamentalist religious, whether Islamic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, or whatever. The vanguard of this new third world are, and here I hope you won't think me too arrogant, performance theorists and artists who practice collaborative performance research, persons who know that playing deeply is a way of finding and embodying new knowledge, renewing energy, and relating on a performative rather than ideological basis. What would be a manifesto for this performance third world? One. To perform is to explore, to play, to experiment with new relationships. Two, to perform is to cross borders. These borders are not only geographical, but emotional, ideological, political, and personal. Three, to perform is to engage in lifelong active study, to grasp every book as a script, something to be played with, interpreted, reformed, and remade. And four, to perform is to become someone else and yourself at the same time, to empathize, react, grow, and change. I am asking, quote, you, whoever is reading this, and at this moment, whoever is listening to me, consider to consider the almost unimaginable because it is so hard for people to take seriously those who are not doing business, making war, or enforcing the will of God. To take seriously those who play, those who create playgrounds and art spaces, to take seriously the personal, social, and world-making force of performance. We must reject ideological, economic, and religious rigidity in favor of flexibility and fluidity. That is my dream for the world. Thank you um, so much, uh, Richard, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a Monday night uh, after Thanksgiving. So that is truly a, a, a great testimony to that city we all live in where art and theater uh, does play a major role. Just to know who has seen uh, Richard Schechner performance or who has been in a seminar, who has been taught by him or – yeah, so there's a, a, a significant uh, influence we, we all see here right away. Richard uh, has not only done one of the most significant theater performances, one of the most famous Dionysus in 69 in the history of theater. He's the editor of the most significant theater magazine, if I may say so, TDR. He created uh, the field of performance studies, coined uh, the world, and, um, and you spoke about the manifesto, but in the beginning about war and art. You also, as we learned today, volunteered for the U.S. Army. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, <laughs> of 
course, I wanted to fight communism. No. Um, I was uh, 24 years old. I had been from birth in the middle to upper middle class of a Jewish family. First in the Jewish neighborhoods, ghettos, if you will, of Newark, New Jersey, and then in the more upscale Jewish uh, extension or remake of those in South Orange, New Jersey, where my brother, my eldest brother still lives. I had gone to elite colleges, Cornell University, Johns Hopkins University, University of Iowa. I had studied with Paul Engel in the Writers' Workshop at Iowa, some of the fruits of which you'll hear later. I realized in 1958, after doing a summer theater in Provincetown, that my horizon was very blinking. I had never really dealt with anybody out of the class of my own, or even out of my own religion. Though, of course, I went to school with people who were not Jewish, but I didn't really deal with them. And I also knew that I would not do so voluntarily. There was no way that I was going to do that. But I thought, hey, if I join the army, I will find a different world. And I went down to the draft board. In those days, there was a draft. And of course, I could have gotten a deferment. I was already 24. That was older than they were taking 18-year-olds. I had a master's degree. I could have gotten a commission. I said, I want you to draft me today. They said, we'll give you a commission. You can become a second lieutenant. Well, I said, basically, I didn't say to them, but to myself, a second lieutenant is the life I've always been leading. I want to be an ordinary soldier. So they took me. Of course, I regretted it almost immediately. <laughs> I mean, when I finally got the reality of having somebody kick my ass at four in the morning, of doing basic training, of finding out that I was going to be assigned to STRAC, the Strategic Army Corps, as they said, the Marines of the Army, and that I was the lowest of the low, I actually uh, called my uh, father and said, get me out of here. He said, no, you, uh, you did it. There's no way I can get you out of here. However, it was extremely helpful to me. It really changed my life in many ways. I'll just give you two of them. First of all, I did deal with and meet people that I would never have met before, a couple of whom I still have as friends. I formed some lasting relations, including one with Paul Schmidt, who was the translator of uh, Chekhov and the Russians and so on, I later met in New York, and Muldoon Elder, a painter in San Francisco, and so on. And very importantly, I was stationed in Fort Polk, Louisiana, which we jokingly said if God had wanted to give the world an enema, he found a place from which to do it, uh, Fort Polk. And uh, uh, Leesville, it was that kind of place. I remember dancing there with a, a one-armed uh, dancing uh, uh, per, uh, maid, you know, uh, bar girl, and whose uh, t a special technique would be to stroke your neck with her stump. Uh, and it, well, it was nice, actually. So uh, 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 I'll make a long story short. I was introduced to New Orleans. I decided when I got out of the Army to go to Tulane University because I loved New Orleans so much. I knew Tulane was not, at that point, one of the great universities. I was offered a full scholarship at the University of Texas. I was offered one at uh, Iowa to go back there, but I decided to go to Tulane because I didn't want to live in Austin. I didn't know what a cool town it was at that point. I certainly didn't want to go back to Iowa City, and I went to New Orleans. The rest, as they say, is history. Thank you uh, so much, Richard. Um, you started as a writer. We saw some of your drawings in your notebooks out there. You have a great interest in film. Why theater? Why did you decide to do theater? Well, there are many sources. One was when I was about 15 or 16, Outside of Bradley Beach, New Jersey, where my summer, uh, my family had a summer home, there was a thing called the Neptune Music Circus. And I went out there, and they were doing uh, uh, musicals like Carousel, which I still have, When You Walk Through a Storm. And, and I saw the life that those people were leading. Uh, you know, uh, uh, girls who were in the dressing room and not so shy about being half-dressed, uh, boys who were with them, the chorus boys, the actors. I said, my God, this is fun. So that was one source. I really wanted to join 
a world where I was going to have fun. Uh, and then I, my imagination began to lead me later on. That was temporary. I did volunteer and I did uh, uh, work at the Neptune Music Circuit. But uh, when I got drafted in the Army, I wanted to kind of get out of my ordinary duties. So there are a lot of stories, but one of them is I said I could direct a play. Well, I, I, I had never directed a play. Uh, well, I had done a few, but I hadn't really done that much. But I was asked to direct a visit to a small planet, which kind of makes fun of the Army in its own way. And I did that in uh, Leesville, Louisiana. So and then I loved directing. I had done a little bit of it in Provincetown earlier. So I, I, I came to this... Uh, I came to it through, as, uh, as many people with their profession, through a kind of accident and appetite combined. And, and at the same time, uh, I was an English major, and I never gave up my love of scholarship. I never gave up my need to write. But I uh, added to it was this appetite for entertainment, really, before, uh, sig quote, significant theater. But then I realized that significant theater, because in my summer theaters, which I did, once before and then once after, I was doing things like uh, No Exit and uh, Craps Last Tape and uh, uh, the Genet's The Maid. I mean, I was doing very heavy theaters for sev summer theater that you could be entertaining and do uh, serious and important theater at the same time. I don't see a contradiction between the two. In fact, I feel, uh, again, I think as Brecht said, space, spice, uh, uh, space, you have to have fun in the theater. It's that kind of, so, and, and it was collective. I really, I, I, I like to have my solitary moments, but I like to work in groups. So a painter is alone for the most part. A writer is certainly alone. I like that aspect. But theater is always with somebody else, both the somebody else with whom you are making it and the somebody else when it's finished with whom you are sharing it. Uh, and both of those social occasions really are Im important to me. Now, today, it took a long time to explain much more of that, but for those of you who weren't here, so that, those were the origins of my wish to be in the theater, and I wanted to be a director because I like to look around. I like to look, you know, Peter Eckersall, and I look way back there, who's back there, and et cetera, uh, and so I don't have the discipline that an actor needs. You're supposed to only look at the person you're supposed to look at, you know. You can't get on stage and say, oh, it's really interesting over there, or I'll look over here. So a director, you know, has the freedom to kind of wander. That's what a director is supposed to be. Have a global view, wander, and to tell other people what to do. And I, I love to do that too. So the, the director's role was well suited for me. I have done a little bit of performing. I made a movie with Richard Serra and Spalding Gray. I have a small role in another movie called Swoon. And if any of you have seen The Magic Mountain of Jodorowsky, Alejandro Jodorowsky, I'm the voiceover when they grow up to the mountain. In, uh, in English, so I have to, but I like movies because you, it's not any work at all. They put a card in front of you, you read it, you know, you don't have to really work like in the theater. So uh, uh, that's why I love, I love the, the, the world of the theater, I love the sociality of the theater, I love the fact that knowledge, the epistemology of the theater can be transferred to people both fancy and plain. Um. For those 71 years of war um, <laughs> in your life, um, you made uh, many of those years. You did it's make more now because uh, I well wrote that two years ago. So 73. Right. Y you made theater. W what is? W I mean, we all know theater, and there are many theater students here. But still, w what does theater mean? What should theater be, especially perhaps in the moment we we, we are going through now? Well, I, I put it in that little manifesto. Theater should be. Uh, we should first of all take seriously. <coughs> the notion that play is redemptive. I said this afternoon, I think STEM should be extracurricular and the arts should be the core of the curriculum. I think we need to train our children in deep playing, not only athletic playing, but as it says, the title of my book, Performed Imaginary, in exercising their imagination. We were in the green room uh, between uh, the last session and the first one, and it was very gloomy in there. <clears throat> I was perhaps, excuse me, the gloomiest. Could not see my way through population uh, expansion, uh, the consumption of resources, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, ecological problems, global warming. And now I'm here and I'm happy. Because I realized 
that you that theater allows you to work you play through the gloom on the other side of tragedy is tomorrow's chance to reenact the tragedy and we need to uh, inculcate or educate our children to the deep catharsis and and uh, healthful benefit of this kind of play <clears throat> not only the play as I say, physical play, but the play of the imagination. What kind of future can you imagine? It's not important at the start to say, how do you get to that future? What do you imagine? What's your perfect day? What's the perfect day if you were two? What if you were a family? What's the perfect day of a family? What's the perfect day of your village? And then work backwards from there. How do you get there? In other words, there, I'm giving you different kinds of imaginative games. I think the theater can do this best of all. I think film does it quite well, but in film you're behind the instrument and you're finally working with thing. In theater, live theater, which I hope will never die, you're working with human beings, sometimes with animals too. You're working with living beings and you're working with them through this process so that even as they move towards a product to entertain, they are themselves being changed by this process. In my experience of making film, you become integers in the film machine. You may do seven takes of a scene, or you may not even see the final scene, the somebody else puts it together, the editor, or the director, but if you're in theater, finally you have to experience and enact the whole thing for other people who are experiencing and receiving the whole thing, or in my kind of theater, participating to some degree in the whole thing. This is healthful. This is something that uh, people uh, should have more of. Sports gives you some of it, but sports is so agonistic, so conflictual. And theater is, uh, it does of course have conflict and so on, it has tragedy and so on, but it also has this remedial and healing aspect to it. Theater is very deeply connected to shamanism and other forms of traditional healing. So for these reasons, I emphasize theater, and as I said in my little manifesto, to play is to do these kinds of things, is to restore ourselves, is to explore the possible. And out of the many explorations of the possible, some actual possible will hopefully take root and make life good for you, your children, my children and grandchildren, and on. I, re I really feel that that's something we need and ought to do and ought to recognize and not think of ourselves as a sideshow, not think of playing and art as something that's extra, but that's intrinsic and central. Thank you. The, um, w w the years in, uh, as a soldier, as it really changed you fundamentally, but also as you learned today, and I was not fully aware of it, also a deep engagement in the civil rights movement where you say you saw those children uh, walking and something happened. I felt at least that how you communicated it that deeply also influenced your theater work. Absolutely. And uh, that maybe that moment, that pivotal moment, maybe you could uh, share again. And well, I, I <coughs> said in brief because how many people were here this afternoon? Because I don't want to, and how many people were not? Okay, so more were not. So I'll tell the story briefly. So when I was a uh, 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 sophomore in college at Cornell University in 1953, I got interested in the Brown versus Board of Education case, which was about uh, uh, segregation in the public schools. I was working on the Cornell, Cornell Daily Sun. I didn't know much about it. As I said, I had lived this middle class life, uh, basically segregated life, and there were African Americans around and some Asians, et cetera, et cetera, but I really was not interacting with them. But uh, so in my research, I found out that a man named Thurgood Marshall, the general counsel of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was the lawyer who was bringing this case to the Supreme Court. And I wrote him a letter. I guess he didn't get too many letters from white boys at that point. And he said, come down to Harlem and meet me and I'll explain the case. So I went down and I met him. It was one of the great moments of my life to be in the room. He wasn't the Supreme Court justice at that point. He was a, a younger a uh, lawyer, he was represented, he, uh, but he was still regal, he was big, and he threw his legs up on the table, he leaned back, and he told me this history from Plessy v. Ferguson in 1898 through to Brown v. Uh, Board of Education. 
and what he was going to argue. And I wrote that out as a series of articles for the Cornell Daily Sun. Still have those articles. Well, you know the case was decided in favor of the NAACP and segregation was ruled illegal and it started the whole chain of events that we're still living through Black Lives Matter. We're still living through that chain of events from then. Marshall then and I maintained a kind of relationship. I never was a good friend of his, but we maintained a relationship. And in 1960, or was it 5960, I think, uh, uh, there was the, uh, segre the case of the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. And I wanted to be there. I was actually assigned by a magazine called Reporter to write about it. So I, uh, I called Marshall. I said, I want to be there. He says, good. I'll give you a letter to Daisy May Bates. She's the local NAACP chairman. You can help that. I was the only white in the basement when those children were there. So they were, they were in this basement across the street from Central High School. Central High School was up like this. They were down in this basement. There were little basement windows, you know, what you look through. And they were dressed perfectly, you know, suits and ties and dresses and all, not like they would normally dress. They were rehearsed. They were told, when you go through, you don't look to the left, you don't look to the right, you go right through. The National Guard is going to open that door. It's all been arranged. Orville Forbes, the governor of the state, is going to be standing there. But the National Guard will remove him, and he's agreed to be removed. He doesn't want bloodshed. It's all a performance, right? He's agreed to be removed because he can say to the people of Arkansas, look, I tried to defend segregation, but I wasn't allowed to. The federal government made me, you know, like the Civil War. And I watched that, and I watched those children come out of that basement and go across the street, and I saw Faubus, and I saw the National Guard literally set him aside, and I saw them walk in into that door. It was an extraordinary performance event. And it further galvanized me to say that this struggle was my struggle. That the Civil War was not over. And I worked in that movement for a long time. My most significant work was one of the three producing directors of the Free Southern Theater. The book is out there with Gilbert Moses and uh, John O'Neill. John is still alive. And we did theater in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana for, as we said, theater for those who had no theater. We performed in churches. We performed in farmyards. We performed when people shot at us, which they did. We performed powerful plays, Waiting for Godot, which a black audience has responded to, this kind of waiting. The white pazzo the incoherent lucky, like their politicians, and Gogo and Didi, two different kinds of uh, black people. We did In White America, Martin Duberman's great documentary about the black experience in the United States, a great uh, documentary play. And we did Pearly Victorious, which is a kind of a parody of relations on the plantation. I directed Pearly Victorious and uh, others directed these other plays, and we toured it. So that, I did that. I also was the first uh, white, uh, one of two, to be arrested for a sit-in in New Orleans. And the civil rights movement segued into the anti-Vietnam War movement, as we know when King finally came out against uh, the war, and when uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, Cassius Clay refused to serve, et cetera, and I was the person who did the first teaching in the South against the Vietnam War, and I led demonstrations. So those things to me were always performative. I didn't use the word. I didn't know the word. I hadn't read J.L. Austin. But they were performative. They were some kind of theatricalization, some kind of demonstration. They were symbolic acts, I called them. They were more than themselves. In the negative vein, terrorism is the same. Terrorism is not about taking territory. It's about a state of mind. I won't go there right now. So I was involved. Uh, I, I saw that the, the theater was part of a wider panoply of actions, including political actions. And I saw that sports did the same thing, that uniforms were costumes, that positions were roles, that coaches were directors, 
You see, I saw all those pounds. It just came, it came to me. What happens to me, as those who know me well know, when I'm in a certain kind of state, things just occur to me. And they're sometimes very interesting. And, uh, and I write them down, and other people want to read them. So it was this broadened view. That's, that's true. It's this broadened view of performance that I, that I got in the early 60s. And I said, let's call it performance and not theater. Now, I took the term from Irving Goffman, who wrote a book, Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, and he had a chapter called Performances, and I liked the word performance, you know, to furnish thoroughly through. But let's call it performance, and let's say theater belongs in it, sports belongs in it, popular entertainment belongs in it, the practice of law belongs in it, medicine belongs in it. Not that that's all these things are, but it's an important part of what they are. A jury is a, an audience. Uh, the contending lawyers are kind of two gladiatorial fighters fighting on behalf of the state and the defense, et cetera, et cetera. We can go through all of these analogies, and they are strict analogies. They are correct analogies. Now, when I first had that idea back in the early 60s, and when I first wrote about it in, a, in an essay called Approaches, 1966, or maybe it was 1964, early, I wrote about it, nobody was thinking that way. I mean, Goffman had thought about performance in everyday life, but he didn't put all this other stuff in. And they hadn't systematized it. And they hadn't put it in relationship to ritual, which I also put it in relationship to, the play and ritual. So I instituted that. And out of that seed came performance studies. No, totally. It was a disruptive uh, invention. You, what theater changed uh, from how it was before, at least how, how we um, um, looked at it. But also, since we also are the university and we are proud to be at the Graduate Center, the Siegel Center is here perfectly situated here at that great institution, over 30 programs on one building, 30 centers. You also always say there's a need for theory. It's not just doing the art, which is of course great, and uh, you need so many people are infatuated, wanted to be a director and an actor, and they like the backstage, but you did your work, but you also stress the need for an academia, for, for, for theory. Um, where do you see that now in the changing fields of humanities? And, uh, of course, theory is important, but theory has to have its feet on the ground. Theory has to be rooted in uh, behavior, in action. Uh, in that sense, I'm a, uh, I'm a physical scientist. You have to have observation, experimentation, verification. It's not about, uh, theory is not about itself. Theory has to have a tangible connection to ongoing experience. So uh, that's why I continue to make theater. I love to make theater. I, I do it as, a, as an artist. But the, uh, the, I, the theater that I do, most recently Imagining O, has a theoretical dimension. And the theory that I conceive of has a theatrical dimension. The two are like uh, night and day. You know, they, they, uh, they seem to be opposite, but they are simply uh, questions of how the Earth revolves around uh, an illuminated dome, uh, sphere. So the sun, if you will, if you go with that analogy, is kind of knowledge. And the dark side of the knowledge may be the performance, which involves uh, tragedy and all these things that happen in performance. And the light side may be involved theory, where we're trying to illuminate what is happening. So I like to think of the two uh, together. Also, given uh, the um, kind of mentality I have, my mentality is such that I can't do something physical without saying, why does it happen this way? Why couldn't it happen that way? What's going on here? That's theorizing, right? Describing it, organizing it, uh, uh, assessing it. And I can't get a theory by, without saying, how can, we, how can we enact that? How can we embody that? So I uh, was one of the ones who introduced into performance the notion of embodiment, that we're dancing. I'm talking now, and I'm moving my body. I'm, I'm dancing my ideas. If I was just sitting back here and saying exactly the same words at this tone, like this, you, you would have a different relationship to it. Maybe it would be better, I don't know, but it would certainly be different. So you once said, you, I'm not a scientist, I'm a social scientist, right? Be, right. It has to be uh, in behaviorism. And I think uh, w what is so great, I do think, and, and respect for master to your generation, that there is a strong connection of a political message that uh, personal experiences and that art itself and making art is essential and of, of real um, significance as part of a joyful participation in the sufferings of the world, as some, some Buddhists, if I remember that right, uh, claimed. 
But coming to, we are coming a bit closer to the end, so you will have time for, for your reading. But you've seen, you have done so much, you have seen so much. What are the most beautiful or most interesting things you have seen on stage? <laughs> well, sir, I I it's, it's hard to pick. You know, what you ask me, what I would pick tonight might not be what I pick tomorrow. But certainly, Grotowski's three great works that I saw in the 60s will always be uh, uh, there. Uh, in my recollection, in my experience, Apocalypsis Cum Figuris, Acropolis, and Constant Prince. These were great productions. They were great productions in terms of their use of space, in terms of the intensity of the performance, in terms especially of Acropolis, of their meaning and their radiation, Acropolis having to do with the Shoah from a Polish uh, perspective. So that would be one. Um, the early Worcester group, when it was still part of the performance group, Drumstick Road especially, a great performance, in which Spalding Gray, who I had the privilege to work with on many productions before he did Drumstick Road, uh, you saw him this morning in Tooth of Crime, but he also was in other productions of mine, um, uh, 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 telling uh, and enacting uh, the circumstances of the suicide of his mother. Mara Saad of Peter Brook, more than the Mahabharata, with Glenda Jackson, I think it was. Uh, you know, when she comes to approach Mara to kill Mara, you know. Hmm. And this one may surprise you because I was only four. Fantasia. <laughs> At the Radio City Music Hall with a live orchestra. Uh, 1938, and, and back in that register, the uh, World's Fair of that time too, and the General Motors exhibit where you rode around and saw the whole city before you. They're not theatrical in the normal sense, but they had a deep effect on me. And the great hurricane of September 1938, which I saw at the seashore and saw the white clouds on the horizon and those huge waves, and forever after I wanted to return to the shore to see more hurricanes. Uh, I've never been at the shore for more hurricanes. I was involved in Sandy. We lost our power, but I was not at the shore. So those are not, the last are not theatrical events. So Acropolis, uh, you know, Marasad and so on, and uh, Rumstick Road, a few others as well. But, but what do these share? They share an enormous commitment to highly accomplished technical acting. In other words, acting at its best, professional level acting. A sense of space and a need and a desire to contact the spectators, the audience, to not exist without some kind of uh, deep relationship with those who are experiencing it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Before I take up too much of your special time, I want to hear you, uh, your writing. We had Richard Schachner making the documentary, Zuta Schechner, the uh, director, Schechner, the editor, Schechner, the performance uh, theorist. We had Richard Schechner, um, the uh, actress trainer, and, uh, and Richard Schechner, the editor. And we also now will uh, learn a new side. It's the Richard uh, Schechner, um, the writer, but not for the theater, but for the writing itself. I think it shows you also a, a, a child or a contemporary of the beat generation, and uh, it is truly a, a big honor uh, for us that you w will share this, and as you earlier said, it's not um, as easy as you might have thought. So um, thank you so much for doing this, and now Richard Schachner. I want to applaud you now, <laughs> before I do this, for what I've just done. joking, but I'm not. <laughs> 26 September 2004, 5.30 a.m. The morning of mom's funeral. 
What am I feeling? When I heard of her death by phone from my brother Arthur, I coughed up a few tears. Not many. I was not thunderstruck. This death was no surprise. I was waiting for it. Yet she was, all in all, a gentle woman. She died with a song in her lungs, her final exhalation. But did she know what she was singing? Does it matter? She was afloat in her own reality. Long before she had left the daily reality of her earlier life, she visited there sometimes with startling lucidity and wisdom. When do you want to go home, Arthur asked Mom in the hospital the day before she passed away. I am home, she replied. Simple, true. To my ears, cruel and final. To her own, some kind of ultimate settlement. It is sad to finally be alone in the world, to no longer have mother or father ahead of me to guide me. Not that mom was much of a guide after her mid-80s. I don't mean that I ever really asked her for advice, but she was there, stalwart and practical, idealistic and down to earth. But once her mind began to sort experience differently, once her outer sight began to fail, though her eyes maintained a turquoise blue clarity that belied her blurred vision, Vaughn began more and more to turn interior. On the porch at Bradley Beach with her legs up on a table, her eyes closed mostly, just feeling the ocean on her face. I have no idea what she was thinking at those times. To be a good son, I used to speak with her, raising my voice as one does with the heart of hearing. But there was never evidence that mom was hard of hearing. My loud voice wanted to break through the barriers of her crumbling mind and get, I don't know where, back to the mother I knew I didn't have the courage to probe too far into the new mom, the woman of broken memories, surging forth and sometimes expressed, the woman who told of Mr. Bradley, who liked little girls, of her inheritance from Shark River to the Verrazano Bridge, of her fragments of memories of her beloved father, Samuel, so dear and frightening also sometimes to me, or of my husband, the Sheridan whose name vanished as soon as he died. In the hospital, my mother was very tiny under the white sheets and white cover. She was barely a ripple in the fabric. She was on her side with the oxygen intake pinned to her nose. Nothing uncomfortable, no intrusion of tubes and intravenous stuff. She was given her dignity at the end, but still... She did not pass at home. She did pass in the hospital, which, as she said, she had made her home. And now her ultimate home is where? In our hearts? In the many offspring of offspring? In her collection of letters and paintings and other memorabilia? She is not only my genetic forebearer. She is emotionally within me, as is, heaven help me, my father, too. And mom passed within the ten days of grace between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, while the book of life lay open to be written in. She died in a liminal time, in a liminal place, but with a settled mind. Wherever her aftermath has migrated to, it came from a special time in the year's progression, the Jewish year's progression. These are some of my thoughts the morning we are going to eulogize my mother, then accompany her body to Oheb Sholem Cemetery in Hillside, New Jersey, and lay her to rest next to Sheridan, my father, and not far from Samuel, her father. May all who come this way find solace. In the days of Homer, a poem for Stacy and Carlos. Where are you there? There you are. In the days of Homer, 
before leaving Ithaca for Sparta, the lovely Polycaste, youngest of Nestor's daughters, bathed and anointed Telemachus with oil. From that bath, Odysseus's son stepped looking like an immortal. Telemachus came to Menelaus's high-roofed home where maids bathed him, anointed him with fragrant olive oil, dressed him, and brought him to a chair next to Menelaus, son of Atreus. In Troy, Helen recognized Odysseus, but she did not give him up. She bathed him, anointing him with scented olive oil. Nausicaa, too, rinsed the resourceful Odysseus, who had not been so well handled since rafting from fair-haired Calypso's island. The fourth maidservant of Circe built an abundant fire under a cauldron, heating the water to a steamy boil, seating Odysseus in the deep bath. She washed the weariness from his body, mixing hot with cold as he desired. In the days of Homer, when Agamemnon sailed the wine-dark sea from the blood dust of Troy home to Argos, Clytemnestra gave him the bath of his life. Dog in an Indian railroad station, 1980s. The most horrid poverty I know of is in the cities. Calcutta, New York, Bhopal. India has a special kind of hard poverty. Broken limbs, leprosy, flies, starvation. I remember once in a railroad station in northern India, I forget the city, but Carol was with me, so it had to be in the north. We heard this horrific howling, a dog howling with fear and pain. And the noise was amplified because we were in the wavy ceilinged place where the trains pull in and out and the ceiling amplified the sounds. People were coming and going nonchalantly, middle-class people, cripples, mothers with drugged or starvation sleepy children draped almost dead across their arms, beggars, all this world of the living, the dying, the almost dead, the ambitious, the going to get somewhere, and the I was dead before I was born kind of poverty together. And over it all, the horrible howling of this tortured animal, a being not knowing why it was being put under pain, a pain so palpable as to be suffocating. Finally, we could see the creature, a mangy dog, dear thing, its neck stretched almost to breaking, being dragged, dragged, dragged across the concrete slabs of the station next to the trains, the trains steaming and snorting, the people rushing to and fro, the hawkers selling oranges, peanuts, newspapers, toys, tea, themselves. Over it all, the howl of the dog, its eyes bulged out, blood bursting from the corners of the eyes, its teeth bared, its tongue hanging out, its throat extended, dragged, 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 dragged by a rope around its neck, all its weight resisting to being pulled, its back body a triangle against the cement, its legs with claws scraping. The man pulling this in-pain beast was indifferent. Get this dog out of my station was in his manner of pulling. His soul was deaf to pain of the dog. He was doing what he was doing. The start of a short story. No, first a very short poem. In winter's cold, coats, winds, winds. Tomorrow approaches yesterday's sun. Who are you? Tomorrow asks. This short story of which I'm going to read the first page and a half is called Think About Me When I'm Gone. I am going away now. I have made provisions for you and the children. Money will be available but I can no longer live with you or them. Don't try to trace me. 
I know how to cover my tracks. Don't wonder where I have gone. Treat me as disappeared, as dead. I want very much to die to the life I lived with you and with the others. That does not mean I want to be reborn. I am satisfied with a simple death, retaining only consciousness, of course, and my own kind of breath. If you want to divorce me, go ahead. I don't care one way or the other. You will not hear from me, but you will receive money on a regular basis. This will continue for a long time, probably long after you are dead. The money operates on a separate schedule. It has a very long half-life. Therefore, I advise you to make provisions for the children or anyone else you designate, even a charity. Find the ultimate recipient or recipients or beneficiaries of this money, which will grow independently of you or me, which will soon have its own immortality. You are right. I am obsessed with money. I got that from you and from my father who farmed money as his beloved crop. But then what? He couldn't harvest as well as he could sow and tend. He gazed on his bank accounts day in and day out, regarding the rows of securities and cash waving in the winds of time. He advised me never to borrow, never to put all my eggs in one basket. Always remain liquid, he counseled. As he lay dying in his hospital bed, I noted that fatal symptom. His urine had ceased to drip into the bag, collecting it from the catheter inserted through his penis into his bladder. His liquidity was failing. I didn't take his advice regarding money. I borrowed to the hilt, maxing out every credit line. I lived like there was no tomorrow. Now there are more tomorrows than I can count. More futures, speculations, options. I gravitate to airports. I buy tickets under all kinds of names. I have many passports. I keep them like a deck of cards, dealing this one or that one according to my needs. I do not make a fool of myself. I don't claim to be Ugandan or even Chinese. I hew to my Eastern European roots and my Mideastern possibilities. It takes money to get passports. Official documents don't grow on trees. None of this surprise you surprises you, does it? You always called me a liar. This disappearing act I am now engaged in is my final response. I am just smoke and mirrors, an illusion. And finally, from an email to Carol, in response to her question, do I believe that animals are B'Tselem Elohim, in God's image? Do I believe that animals are in God's image? Not believing in God, I don't know what it means to be in her, his, its image. But going beyond my atheism, do I believe that animals share whatever it is that is fundamental, essential, real in the cosmos? Whether or not this cosmos was found, atheism, or made, God the creator. Yes, the animals are part of it all as we are. Then why do I eat their flesh, condone and collaborate in their slaughter? The weak answer is that I am not a perfected human being. And in my seeking pleasure, the pleasure of my mouth, of my appetite, I exploit the destruction of sentient beings strong answer is that I accept my imperfection and in accepting it to some degree transform it into my own perfected being. I take from various religions as you know. One of the ideas of Hinduism that fascinates me is reincarnation. After all, no matter is ever lost. It just goes from here to there. So too of perhaps the non-material effervescence of our existence. At the mythic level, reincarnation allows for a slow improvement over the span of many, many lifetimes. It makes each life a recapitulation of the last and a rehearsal for the next. This then gets folded into the Zen present-centeredness so that past and future collapse into now. Fancy, I know. 
and I will enjoy the roast chicken this evening. That's all for now. Thank you. I had a little more to read, but I thought chicken is a good start. Stop. Maybe if you can. Well, you know, I can uh, try the story when I uh, find it. Yeah. Do you have a mic? Let me get one. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, a comic story. I want to tell you. Long enough time, someone will ask something. <laughs> yes. We are recording it, so if you could yeah, please. The idea of making the world a, a better place. Tom O'Lean is the story of this movie. Okay, go ahead. Well, I it's a fine idea, but uh, isn't that work? <laughs> so, in a way, uh, 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 contradictory. I, I don't see work and play as contradictory. I think play is a kind of work and work should be a kind of play. In other words, I don't see play as a kind of easy thing and work as a kind of hard thing or work is obligatory and play is voluntary. I don't see any of those distinctions. In my theoretical writing, which I've done quite a bit of, the play mode is a particular kind of mode of possibility while the work mode is a mode of inevitability. It's not about the difficulty, it's about the process. So that, uh, 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 to, to put it in Greek tragic terms, uh, tragedies are works. Rehearsing them is play. And in rehearsing them, you are opening the possibilities of doing them in many, many different ways. Once they have been fully rehearsed and they've been performed and you follow, then it becomes a work. So there's works of art which have this kind of inevitability. And I tr uh, was emphasizing in that manifesto, or trying to emphasize, that uh, the, uh, the uh, seriousness, if you will, paradoxically, and the importance of this play mode, of the mode where possibilities are left open, where the imagination and the fiction uh, 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 is on a continuum with the actuality. And that in so far as we begin to play with those modes, the needle of actuality may shift towards the, uh, the fiction. We may be able to realize something. You know, I'm not Pollyanna about the future of the world, but I'm not as depressed as I was before uh, coming into this room when I was back there with uh, my friends and we were really, uh, we really bummed each other out. So, uh, uh, yeah, the chorus, <laughs> exactly. <coughs> my, my, my problem is that w when it becomes the job of the uh, art uh, to fix things, it, I think it's, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, something's lost there. Uh, that's not its only job, you know. Uh, just because I do the dishes doesn't mean I always do the dishes. Uh, that's all I do. So art, uh, obviously, uh, I think Horace said it first and Brecht echoed it. Our art is to entertain and to educate. So those are two other things. And to the, do the work of healing the world is still something else again. To pass the time is something else again. In other words, again, what I was emphasizing today is the multiplicity and contradictory uh, 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 qualities of, of art making, of living. It, it doesn't have to all be uh, uh, mathematically consistent. So art. Some art will help save the world. Some art will just pass the time. Some art will be pleasant. Perhaps the one that helps save the world will also be pleasant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not an either or for me. But I do feel that uh, where I am uh, a little bit rigid is that I feel that in our educational system, in, in our popular imagination, in what we're doing, we need to uh, put more emphasis, grant more respect to the art-making process 
to as part of the fundamental education of human beings uh, and just as very poor people put an enormous energy to exercise the rituals of their religion I've seen people with hardly anything in parts of the world put in what little they had to do a puja to do a, a, a religious observation you know observance and so on so people uh, do give material things to do non-material things if you will in order to save their uh, souls in order to participate with their deities, whatever their reasons. And I want to see that same kind of devotion to the art-making process. So it's not a question of diverting the surplus. It's a, pre it's a question of in, in engaging the body of stuff so that people make art the way they make religion. And religion very often is art. You know, when they made the rose window a chartre, they were making art and religion at the same time. When they did the caves at Altamira, they were making some kind of ritual and uh, uh, art at the same time. So we have examples of it. But now we've bifurcated and we've divided it off and we put art in the uh, uh, lower category of uh, value, let's put it that way. And unless it happens to be an object art, like a painting, then it can be millions of dollars worth. But at that point, they're not buying the art. They're buying the reputation of the art. That's a whole other discussion. So why these artworks are so valuable is uh, the same reason why gold ingots are valuable. In and of themselves, they're not valuable. One more, one less Van Gogh. doesn't make any difference. Uh, but So that's a different question. Hello, <laughs> how are you? I'm good, how are you? Terrific. Um, I, I don't know if you've covered this already, but um, a lot of people now, you know, with internet being so popular, are talking about um, having theater where people and are, are not all in the same place at the same time, and I was wondering if the element of time and space has to have integrity for there to be a, a work of theater, or if you can do theater um, in a remote fashion using the internet. Yes, uh, never underestimate the means of communication. This is Elizabeth Roof. We worked together um, way back in the day, as it were, and you don't look a, a minute older. So, um, no, maybe, maybe a minute older. Uh, I function according to and, 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 not either or. So the kind of art I'm involved in is face-to-face -face because I like to look at these faces. I like to be in the presence of the body. I like the heat of it. Of course, I use my computer and I use the Internet. I do not in any sense deny the possibility and the operation of what you're talking about. But uh, because the uh, art of the Internet is audiovisual and not the other three senses, and especially the heat of the flesh near to you, et cetera, et cetera, I am more for, the uh, in my own practice, for that. And also because uh, airtime becomes valuable, even if it isn't valuable, we treat it as valuable. While rehearsal time, uh, even though it is valuable, we treat it as if it isn't. I mean, we have a certain kind of thing that happens when we meet in a room together and so on and so forth. So I entirely agree that one can make the kind of art you've referred to. My own preference is not to. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of people who make the kind of art you're talking about. Um, I, what you were talking about, that uh, art is basically the rehearsal of um, one's future, perhaps. Uh, made me think of a professor of mine, Morris Peckham, who wrote a very well-known book in the 60s, Man's Rage for Chaos, in which he set up a theory about art as being our human uh, capacity to, as, an adapt, uh, as, a, as a tool for adaptation, for adapting to discontinuities, to incongruities, that art is not for making order, but rather to rehearse, to deal with disorder, with discontinuities. And I was wondering, he did not use the term perf performance, but your, your sense of performance and rehearsal to performance made me think about that. And I was wondering if you had a comment to make about 
this almost biological view of the place of art in human endeavor. Well, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Newton's second law of thermodynamics, um, but in it he talks about entropy, which basically says that everything finally runs down and stops. What Einstein did to uh, Newton's second law of thermodynamics or, and what Heisenberg, what the quantum theorists did, is say it's not true. Uh, things don't run down and stop. There is always a kind of a chaotic or indeterminate element that renews and changes it, and we haven't yet, uh, 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 and uh, who knows if we'll ever be able to actually harmonize Newton whose laws work very well uh, at localities, with quantum mechanics and relativity, which work in technically what's called non-locality, which means uh, it, it, uh, act, uh, spooky action at a distance, as Einstein said. All right, now how does this relate to what you're, you're saying? I think that art is, of course, uh, for the most part, a uh, construction of order in the possibility of disorder, except for that or art which tries to construct disorder out of order. So John Cage would try to construct art that was fundamentally disorder out of order, in other words, saying that everything uh, may be random and that there are deeper structures that may be orderly in the disorderliness of a random uh, piece of music or uh, ambient noise or what have you. So. What fascinates me is the huge range of possibilities from Newtonian uh, physics, which would be, you know, like uh, an Ibsen play, to quantum mechanics, which would be closer to uh, John Cage. And therefore, I cannot myself give a single answer. Some art creates order. Some art de uh, depends on indeterminacy, and indeterminacy, by definition, is if not chaotic, because that is an ultimate uh, decay, but is at least not uh, predictable, except, again, to use a, a, a fancy word, stochastically. You can say that a uh, hundred times you flip the coin. Island, we've talked about it, but we haven't really dealt with it. It's, it's much worse than Guantanamo Bay, now, although I shouldn't compare two terrible things like that. Guantanamo Bay is very bad, too, but we have our Rikers Island. And, uh, and, and other things, and homelessness and all. But insofar as we can bring those into consciousness and into play, yes, I think that's good. I think the actions that are occurring, I think what's happened at Princeton is extraordinary. It's not that uh, Washington and Jefferson didn't have slaves. They did. Jefferson freed his, and they were moving in a certain direction. Uh, Wilson was egregiously and consciously retrograde. He was consciously moving in the other direction. He was undoing Reconstruction. He was ridding the government when he was president of African-American participation. So it's not simply what people do. What's the direction on the road that they are traveling? So is Jefferson more of a racist at death than he was 20 years earlier or less? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I feel that that to come out. So when I was uh, discussing with members of my family at Thanksgiving, uh, my extended family in New Jersey about this question, some of, of whom are students and former students at Princeton. And they said, well, you want to erase history? I said, not at all. I, I think there should be a plaque saying uh, Woodrow Wilson, as President of the United States, removed 850 uh, black civil servants and then became President of Princeton University. I think that's uh, accurate. We don't have to name a dormitory after him, which is an honor. We should describe it. We shouldn't avoid history. Or you may want to have uh, something that says, we are honoring Woodrow Wilson at this point for his presidency of Princeton University. Realize also that he did such and such and such and such. Uh, now, does that mean we go back and do Jefferson and all, all the other uh, people who uh, were also uh, racist and segregation? Not necessarily, but it's not like uh, one shoe fits all. You start where you start and you make your progress where you make your progress. And it's about, it's again about, it's the same as the demonstration civil rights movement. You bring attention to something. What was the second part of your question? 
or the role of theater? Well, I, I don't think I need to answer that. Obviously, the role of us as artists, citizens, is to, you know, we shouldn't only do political action theater. I mean, we can, uh, but I'm not Augusta <laughs> Boal. I'm not saying to do only political action theater. I like to do entertainment theater. I like to do tragedy. I like to do a lot of things. But I think part of what our uh, palette should be should be active theater. And in the period that you're talking about, I did the piece in theater. I did guerrilla theater about the Vietnam War, uh, et cetera. I haven't done uh, activist theater recently, but there are the people doing it. I think it's part of the palette. I think anybody who does only the same thing over and over again uh, is kind of like uh, like Mondrian, uh, or you know, one of those painters that just kind of repeats themselves. It's okay, but it's not my kind of thing. You know, my question emanates from your comparison of uh, or your use of Nehru's idea of the non-aligned world, um, which, interestingly enough, ha has become irrelevant in a in the post-Cold War wa world. Irrelevant? It is irrelevant in some sense because the bipolarity of the world is is gone. So, you know, I was wondering what kind of polarities are you using when you're sort of replacing the third world by, you know, with artists and uh, so uh, on. I'm saying that artists have to be a counterbalance to the corporate and nationalist and religious forces that operate in the world. Uh, I think that uh, virulent religion, uh, rampant corporatism, and militarized sovereignty are all enemies of the human project and they need to have some non-alliance to them, to stand up to them, to perform uh, uh, in, in contradistinction uh, to them. That's what I was meaning. Um, thank you again, Richard. And a, maybe as a closing bookend, will you uh, read us something? Uh, a little bit. I read such a horrible thing about India. I'll read something a little more uh, descriptive. Thank, thank you. book published in India, but it's from a notebook from 1978 when there was a great flood in India. She, the Ganga, who the Puranas say came rushing out of the sky, her great fall to earth softened by her root through Shiva's hair, its many strands breaking and dispersing her powerful flow. As Shelley says, life like a dome of many colored glass stains the white radiance of eternity. Or as I redact it, the great white dome of eternity is shattered into the many colored shards of experience. So the symphonic Hindu panoply continuum of myriad gods converged to express the single force of life. In the process of forcing life to become manifest, the balance, the poise, and the stillness of the uncolored, unmanifest, absolute is dispersed into the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the hots and colds, the livings and dyings of my experiencing and yours. This is the great clothesline on which is hung all philosophy and art and all else we do or imagine or think. Coming down to the river on the cycle rickshaws, we passed a corpse bundled up in white silk, tied from head to toe like some terrific Christmas present, but so tightly that the forms of the body from the round head to the upright pointing of the ten toes plainly show, with flowers under the head, all bound to a palanquin made from big green bamboo shoots and branches, a mattress for the corpse not unlike a charpoy that the living sleep on, carried by six men, chanting and sometimes laughing, not grieving. This is for later, at the burning gap, or for the nearest relatives. I remember meeting a weeping old man at Manakarnika Ghat, that's the burning Ghat, in 1976. He told me he was weeping because his son had died. He should have be cracking my skull instead 
I will be cracking his. The order of nature had been disrupted and inverted. A mistake had been made. Or bad karma was working itself out. The tears were not against death, but against the injustice, this cosmic payback. Thank you.